Just think how big the problem is if they don't even realize that they're part of the problem. Good morning, I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Penguins. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or baseball. I also happen to offer daily shots of Steelers and Pirates in addition to this one, and maybe you can go check those out as well. Penguins versus Capitals tonight in Washington, 7.08 p.m. face-off at Capital One Center. And when the visitors take the ice, rest assured that they'll do so with 12, not six, 12 forwards who feel like their main mission there is to score goals. And that's kind of a problem, you know? When you're talking about this team lacking defensive consistency or anything remotely resembling defensive consistency, that's where it starts. It's not the top six. It's not the team being old because the truth is the old guys are the ones who are carrying this team from a production standpoint. And what's missing is defensive commitment from the third and fourth forward lines. What's Missing is defensive prowess from a couple of the defensemen, notably Brian Dumoulin. And what's missing is NHL-level backup goaltending. All of which, all of which fall under the category of preventing goals, which is only what this team should be defined by once it gets to the most important games. But it isn't. And that's one of many reasons I really, really, really didn't like that Florida game. Yeah, they beat the Panthers in overtime 7-6. Everybody was excited. Tons of goals. It was the 1980s all over again. Uh, Wonderful, genuinely wonderful moments for Chris Letang throughout that and then afterward. But they didn't defend. And the people who need to defend, the people who need to be providing that spark, that energy, that flash that only ever seems to come from Jason Zucker on any consistent basis, don't seem to get it. I mean, to an extent, to an extent they do, at least when it comes to saying the right things. I asked Ryan Paling after the game, and he was terrific. And I asked him you know, how much, how important it is for the bottom six forwards to step up in both of these areas if you can just make it hard on their team and whether that's the top end guys with lower end guys i mean it's it's contagious when you wear teams down and then i think in the third period when that happens you can kind of overtake them and i think that's a big thing that we preach here too i asked dan heinen too and and this was right after he'd scored his first goal since october and he saw it pretty much the same way i think i mean you always want to be um Helping the team any way I can, but yeah, it starts starts defensively. You know, if, if you're not scoring, you definitely don't want to be letting be letting them in. So um, I think it starts there. But yeah, for sure, we want to be reliable um, in uh, tight games. Great, great. They said the right things, but I watched the game, and so did you, and so did Mike Sullivan and his staff, and they saw the same things that we did. And that's that these guys weren't at all prioritizing the prevention of goals, even when they had a one goal lead late in the third period. There were still odd man breaks given up, a clean breakaway, drop passes, centering the puck. Paling did this from behind the Florida goal line. To what end? Why are you doing that? To make it seven to five? Really? From the fourth line? I understand they had a couple of goals. Again, they played well. But no, no. There has to be a much sharper delineation when it comes to who does what on this team. What I liked best, what I found most encouraging about the fourth line's play the other night against Florida wasn't... You know, Drew O'Connor scoring. Drew O'Connor set up Heinen. Uh, Paling, like I said, was all over the puck. It was an impressive show from these guys. But the impressive show doesn't have to involve offense. If you get it, great. I'm not knocking it. 
But the number one thing, what has to be going through their crania, is that the plural of cranium? I don't know. Crane, crania, crania, I don't even know. Whatever's under those helmets. What has to be going through them is that these guys have to be thinking, we're going to take the attack and press it. We're going to control that puck deep in that team's zone. And when you're facing uh, an outfit like the Panthers, which is known to have, other than Aaron Ekblad, almost nothing on the blue line. They've had a really, really tough time defending. It doubles because that's where you win the game. Whereas when you do bad things like the drop pass that Brock McGinn made outside the Florida blue line, like the situation I mentioned with Paling, like Brian Dumoulin stumbling over himself in that late faceoff with a couple minutes left and giving Sam Reinhardt a clean break. No, no. Know who it is that you are. Know who it is that you're supposed to be within a winning dynamic. You know where that starts, right? I'm not avoiding that subject. Mike Sullivan has to make that clear, and he has to make it that much clearer than he already has, because I know that would be the answer that I got from him right now if I asked, hey, coach, are you making this clear? And he'd come back and say, you have no idea. The extent to which we're making this clear, that we're emphasizing it. Okay, then guess what's next? Those players who don't listen to that, your bottom six forwards who don't heed this specific call, they're welcome to sit. They're welcome to devalue their own futures in the National Hockey League because they aren't buying in to what's needed for this team. And what's needed for this team, uh, I'm not going to sit here and rank this over competent NHL backup goaltending, but it's close. It's close. When we come back, J1Q. Joe, who asks, and this is pretty blunt to the point, in what universe is not using Ricard Raquel in OT thought to be a good idea? Well, Joe, you're right. And since you sent this to me after the Florida game, I'll presume you're right in response to watching Sullivan finally get that right. Raquel was out there for the three-on-three. Finally. And on a similar note, Jeff Carter was only out there to take two face-offs. And in each event, he would sprint immediately toward the Penguins' bench. Both of these were firsts. Both of these were grossly overdue. It's funny, when 3-on-3 OT came into play and everything looked so chaotic mostly because it was that chaotic, coaches, including Sullivan, would just kind of shrug it off and say, you know what, there's not much coaching that you can do in this setting. And he would actually say that on a regular basis. And he wasn't alone. Other NHL coaches would say the same thing. Over time, we've seen uh, teams adopt this extraordinarily patient approach toward possessing the puck and not just firing it and, you know, hoping and then going and retrieving it because there is no retrieving it now. You lose the puck in OT, you'd better buckle up because you're about to go through a minute and a half solid of defending. And that's just the way those things have gone. Now, now when you saw the Penguins lose eight of their first 10 overtimes, yeah, it starts getting serious. That's a lot of points that you're leaving behind. And you can't just say, oh, well, you know, it's a different game. It's a different thing. You still got to play it. You've still got to play it. Those overtimes and shootouts, as gimmicky as they are, and they are, they still account for half of the total output that you were hoping to achieve on that particular night. It's a big deal. 
It really is. It's a big deal. And in a conference like this, it could come down to just a point or two. And we'll all be looking back when we get to, you know, March and April and say, wow, if only they hadn't completely sucked in overtimes, this would have been very different right about now. So on one hand, you know, kudos to Sullivan for doing the thing that he did with Carter. It didn't work all that great. Carter won. Uh, Carter lost the first draw and then he won the second one. And again, in each case, he went straight off. Now, I don't know if that applies depending on where the puck is on the rink. If there's an odd band break, maybe Carter's required to stay on because we didn't see enough examples of it. But it's it's a good start, and other teams are doing it. The Penguins are a little late to it. But possession is so important. The initial possession is so important. How many of these overtimes have you seen the Penguins lose, like, boom, right off the bat? Well, guess what happened to get that started? Right. They lost the faceoff. They lost that first possession. So that's one thing. But man, I am with you on the Raquel thing. Okay. I I have yet to see the hockey circumstance in which he doesn't do well. This is just a really high quality, complete hockey player. And to not have him out there and to not have him getting a chance on power play one when we've seen Brian Rust struggle in particularly the area of finishing the way he has. I, 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 I don't understand it. This is such a good, good head coach and such a smart man. But my goodness, does he get stuck in certain areas and not find a way to lift himself out of the quagmire. He was handed basically a gift with Raquel, someone who would solve a lot of different problems the Penguins have had over the past couple of years. Uh, I know that a lot of people, and I'm one of them, have been critical of Ron Hextall a lot this year, but Raquel was a superb acquisition for a second round pick. And then to find a way to keep him over the long term in a summer where you also had to sign Gino and Latang and everybody else. And Rust, that was really, really good work, too. But you have him. It's okay to use him. He's really good. You know, I appreciate the question. It's crazy that it had to be asked. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Penguins. We'll do another one of these tomorrow. Uh-huh.